This is the second video from Chapter 10, Section 2, dealing with triangulated brace frames. And in this particular video, we're going to focus on tall buildings. The previous one focused on low and mid-rise buildings. When the building becomes very tall, it becomes a profoundly important issue that we give the brace frame the widest possible footing in all directions for maximum resistance to overturning of the building. And the solution ends up being a tubular truss that surrounds the building. In other words, it, is, it wraps itself around the building and in so doing claims the largest possible footprint. It becomes, in essence, a trust tube, which is not only very strong in terms of resisting the overturning moment, but is torsionally very stiff also. And we discussed in a previous video that when we have a fairly low rise building, we only need to brace one bay. And in fact, if the height of the building is not too great and the width of the bay is wide enough, then these footings might be simply enlarged versions of spread footings. They're clearly going to be larger than this footing because this footing only resists gravity load, as is the case for this one. But these footings not only have to resist more gravity load because they're supporting half a bay on each side, but they may also have great downward forces, for example, on this side due to wind force towards this wall. Um, there's a compressive force thrown into this member uh, and a compressive force coming out of this diagonal, which are pushing down on this footing. So this footing has to be substantially larger. This may be the control actually where we need enough weight in this footing to resist the upward tension. As the building gets larger, these two footings get bigger and bigger as the building gets taller, and eventually they merge into one large grade beam type footing. These might be simple spread footings that are square in plan, but this is going to be an elongated grade beam type footing uh, to get a, enough lever arm from the soil's action to overcome the levering action of the wind tending to overturn this frame. As the building gets even taller, this footing is going to get even heavier and even wider because it has to provide the ballast to keep this portion of this frame from lifting up off of the ground. If we push this far enough to a tall enough structure, this central bay is simply not even close to enough to stabilize this building. In other words, not only would we have to have an enormous footing, which we haven't even really properly rendered here, but we'll have so much flexibility in this structure and so much deformation. This is the undeformed shape. This is the deformed shape. And granted, in this particular rendering, uh, we've exaggerated the amount of movement or deformation. But in reality, um, whatever it is will be excessive for a building that's as slender in, in terms of its braced frame as this building is. So one of the things we can do is we can triangulate all these bays also so that the effective width of the lever arm is not this width right here, but is the overall width of the building. So that's what this would look like. And by the way, all of these structures were simulated in the same structural analysis um, process. In other words, they're part of the same file. They have the same loads on them. Um, and we're seeing relative deformation. So the deformation here is really small compared to what we're seeing over there. On the other hand, this might be overkill and we're introducing a lot of diagonal members here which are interfering with the architectural use of the space 
because they limit where people can walk through the space and where doorways and openings can be put. So we sometimes ask ourselves the question, how many of these do we really need? And, and one way of doing that is to just back off and keep taking them out and taking them out. And you'll notice in this case, we've left out five of those diagonals for every one that we've put in on each side. And you'll notice that the deflection in the case of this structure is much better than this. It's not as good as this, but sort of from an economic analysis point of view, it's as if with about 17% the number of members, we're getting 80 or 90% of the benefit in that this is much closer to that than it is to that. So um, this is a way of bracing the building internally with full triangulation. The dilemma, of course, is the more of these members you have, the more it's interfering with the um, architectural utility because you have elements interfering with people's movement through the building. So one solution to that is we say, let's not even work off of the core, let's not work off of the inside of the building. Let's create the biggest possible braced frame that we can, we can provide this building with. Uh, short of exceeding the footprint of the building? And the answer is a trust tube. This is the Alcoa building in San Francisco. It's broad on one face and narrower on the other. This, by the way, is the narrow edge, which doesn't look that narrow when you're looking up the building, but when you look at it from a distance, it is. Um, so you'll notice these columns are occurring at uh, triangulation, at connection points in the triangulation. So all under any kind of load, this is a really excellent triangulated shear wall. This is a view of the wide face of that building with another iconic building in the background. Now, uh, the Alcoa building is in San Francisco, which is a major earthquake zone, and it's one of the reasons that this triangulated system was explored for this particular building. Uh, and in any seismic environment like that, this sort of triangulation can be a very productive and logical approach. It doesn't have to be a really high rise building. In this case, this is the uh, Oakland Alameda um, Stadium, which I guess has been renamed the Oracle Stadium. It has a tensile roof that's dished out that uh, is held with steel cable, but then that's covered with concrete. So it's a concrete roof with a substantial amount of mass and it's in a very high seismic zone. So the way they've chosen to brace it is to provide this uh, full trussing all around the circular boundary of the building. Um, this sort of exterior trust tube framing system also works very well for retrofits. So this is a building about which there was some concern when I lived in Berkeley many years ago. And when I went back for a visit, I discovered they had retrofitted it with this external cross bracing, which they've done the full face of the building on this side because the highest wind load is on this face or the one opposite it and that produces the highest shear forces in this wall. And on top of that, the wall is not as deep in terms of being a cantilever. So they've chosen to cross brace this entire facade. This facade, on the other hand, they've cross braced part of it here and part of it over there. But relative to seismic forces in this direction, uh, they didn't need, feel like they needed to fully brace it. And so, Basically, it's like they've got a cantilever coming out of the ground on this side and a cantilever truss coming out of the ground on that side uh, to stabilize it against seismic forces in this direction. Uh, here's another example of the same thing. They didn't want to trust this entire building, uh, so they picked a part of it they felt they really could trust very effectively, and it was a portion that they were particularly concerned about. And so 
this portion actually braces this part and if you could see this you'd see that there are extra beams that have been attached to the edges of these uh, floor plates that come back into this truss so whatever loads are generated in them come along and are distributed into this truss system. This is a pin joint down at the base and I show this to sort of r refresh your memory. We talked about this kind of connection as the support at the ends of bridge girders uh, where we have many plates and the idea is the more plates you have the more uh, shear you're putting in this bolt in the sense that in order to fail this this pin or this rod you would have to shear it at this plane and that plane and that plane and that plane and so forth so we're able to get away with a very small pin by uh, creating a situation where the only way it can fail is to be sheared many times all simultaneously now, one thing to think about in the case of seismic zones, uh, we've become more and more sensitive to the fact that we need some flexibility in the building uh, when seismic events occur. So these diagonal brace elements um, are often made nowadays with some sort of energy absorbing mechanism. Okay, so here's one of the truly iconic uh, trust structures. This is the John Hancock building in Chicago, and this is what that looks like from the Sears Tower. And it's a commentary that this is an extremely tall building, and when you're on the top of the Sears Tower, you're looking down on it, and it doesn't look that big anymore. It has two towers, radio towers on the top, um, and this is kind of an aside, but uh, the people at SOM tell me that those towers were the best money-making feature of any of the high-rise buildings that they put up. This is a slightly closer view, and you can begin to see the triangulation on the face. And here's another view, and this is a look upward. Uh, showing two faces with the triangulation apparent. Now I want to make sure you understand that the triangulation here is not actual structure. This is Chicago and you can't afford to have massive pieces of steel exposed to the freezing cold wind and also going to the inside of the building. So what they've done here is they've very artfully crafted a facade which is expressing the nature of the structure that's occurring inside. So it's not exactly dishonest. It, it's as honest as you'd ever want to be in that kind of environment because it is really miserably cold there during the wintertime and it also gets very hot during the summertime and the sun beats down on the structure and so these uh, heat trains or uh, thermal bridges would be very serious issues during the summertime also. So this is, shows the best pattern of the wide face of this building. And there are a couple of interesting things that should be pointed out. One is, under wind load on this building, uh, huge forces are generated in the corner columns. And we'd like all of those, those forces in the corner columns to get shared across all of the rest of the columns in this face. And it's not too bad when you think a point here moves downward because of all the compression in this corner column. And the same is true for a point over here. This tension member, or these tensile web members, can then act to throw a force into this column also. So we know this column is going to participate with the two corner columns in driving those forces down to the foundation. This column though is somewhat different as is the case all the way down because it does not go to an intersection of these web members. Um, this is a particularly crucial point because it has major implications to a whole bunch of architectural issues. In order to assure under those forces that this member doesn't just 
bend this member, but that some force is thrown into this member to make it participate. Um, we have this situation. We have tension in these members. We have a floor element in which we bury a tension member. And so we've now created this sling where this tension member, that tension member, and that tension member are all activating this compression member and that compression member to get them to participate in this process. Now what this meant was that the people at Skidmore, Owings, and Eric Merrill who designed this building put this delicate taper uh, into the building. And at the time they thought, well, that's not a big deal. There's no significant ramifications to that. But then you notice that that means these members are all different. This one's different from that, which is different from that. And so now what they had to do is figure out a way to line up a floor with that intersection of a web member with that vertical member so that they could bury this tension member because they didn't want that tension member occurring in the middle of somebody's window and destroying the view. So the net effect of that is there are many different floor to floor dimensions in this building and the, the structure uh, and the architectural drawings became much more complicated as a result of this decision to taper the building. And all this occurred before we were using computers to deal with these sorts of things. And so huge numbers of man hours were spent making sure that all the dimensions and all these drawings were carefully worked out. So this was a building where you might only need a set of 20 drawings in the old days, uh, or 30 at most, um, and the drawings would be very sparsely done. In the case of this building, uh, the number of drawings was probably 10 times that many. Okay, so this is the, the appearance of that building at the base. And here you see that very strong triangulation and where this web member crosses that column, a floor occurs. Where this web member crosses that column, a floor occurs. And all of those things, as I mentioned, are impacting the floor-to-floor uh, -floor spacing all up the building. One of the things I absolutely love about this building is there's a whole sh series of shops at this level. And then down in this recessed volume, there's another whole set of shops, um, and this is just a really iconic urban space that tends to attract a lot of traffic uh, during those periods when the weather is nice in Chicago, which unfortunately is not too often. Uh, but this just gives you a fisheye view of that with the uh, Hancock building and this recessed or depressed volume, uh, which as I said, uh, attracts a lot of uh, traffic uh, when the weather's nice. Okay, so here's another example of a triangular tube structure. In this case, there are no verticals. This is sometimes referred to as a diagrid structure. It's been around for quite a while. As I mentioned uh, previously, uh, people have been building yurts uh, in the Himalayas for centuries using this kind of structural concept. And there is another building of this type in New York, which uh, does have a diagrid construction and its diagrid is very fine. So its appearance is really quite different from this one. But the folks who designed this building uh, made this structure fairly coarse. And I think part of it was that they were seeking an iconic image that would look unlike anything else in New York. And I certainly think they achieved that especially with these funny looking notches in the corners, which they have to have because they're basically saying, we're going with this system. There are no vertical elements and we're gonna let its geometry decide what the final geometry of the building is. So these triangles, by the way, are four stories high, which means for wind load or seismic loads on these intermediate floors, they would be bending these web members except there's a core in this building 
that is a very good beam in terms of getting from this floor down to that floor. So all the bending that might be caused uh, due to those intermediate on those intermediate floors loading the structure uh, is absorbed by that core. And this shows one of the joints on that building just to give you an idea of how complicated it gets to do a structure like this. But with modern fabricational techniques, it turns out that joints like this are not terribly difficult. They're not done by your sort of typical fab shop, but they can be done without an extraordinary amount of effort. Uh, down at the base of this building, there's a classic building, that uh, historical building that they gutted the core and basically built this new structure internal to that. And at this bottom level, they abandoned the diagrid structure, which is a little ironic because at the very bottom floor is where you have the highest possible uh, overturning moment and the highest shear forces on the structure. And it's sort of surprising at that point that they would abandon the system. But they did, and they've certainly compensated for that quite well. This is what that interior space looks like at the base. It's a huge atrium space where people can sit and hold conferences or work. And again, it's triangulated. It's just triangulated in a very different way. So it's not trust tube at the bottom anymore. It's a, a another variation where the triangulation runs towards the interior of the building rather than around the boundary of the building. Okay, so to come back to this example, we mentioned that you can, you can have this triangulated core and then you can triangulate a few bays and those collectively activate uh, the perimeter columns as part of the resistance to overturning. Um, and I think of this as uh, trust, but it's also rigid frame-like in that there are major bays that are not trust. And so we can kind of think of it as a rigid frame with a horizontal and another horizontal and this big vertical piece. And those parts are fully triangulated and they create what I call a triangulated frame. In other words, the whole thing is not triangulated just certain portions of it are. And that theme has been used on buildings. Uh, and here's an example. In the case of this building, we had a central triangulated core with triangulated pieces coming off of it called outriggers. In this case, they triangulated the corners of the building. And if they had not done any bracing between them, this huge deformation that you see here is kind of indicative of what would happen. And again, I, I emphasize that this drift is actually uh, 26 inches here, 25 inches. Um, and it's been drastically uh, exaggerated. But that's, that's not an acceptable amount of drift. So basically they said, how many of these bays do we have to triangulate in order to get these two pieces working together? And what they came up with was that they were going to triangulate the base at this one intermediate part and up at the top. And so that was the final geometry of the building, which you see over here. This is another example where you could take two triangular tubes, which by themselves are not stiff enough or sturdy enough, and you can brace frame them. You can uh, connect them together with these elements. So again, I think of this this because this is not a fully triangulated opening. I think of this as sort of a rigid frame structure where the rigid frame parts are actually triangulated. So this is the combination of triangulation and uh, non-triangulation in essence. Um, so this is another example. Here we have these towers which are truss tubes, and then they're connected together with elements that further help resist uh, movement in this direction. And the reason they need to be stronger that way is because of all the wind load on the bridge, um, which tends to produce more overturning uh, moment 
relative to forces perpendicular to the bridge than along the bridge. Here's another example. You may not see it as that similar, but in a way, here we have trussed tubes, which are braced to each other by leaning in together. So there, here we have a, an element coming across this moment connected. Here we have another. And then finally, they touch each other from there on up. Um, this structure, uh, first of all, is frame on the overall scope. Uh, then it's triangulated on the faces. So each of these elements is a trussed tube. And then when we look up close, we see that the tr even the truss work on this truss is trussed. So here are some truss elements or web members, and they are they're boxed trusses. So it, it's a very efficient and very economical structure. This, this structure here is just pure genius in terms of efficiency and economy. It had to be lightweight, not only to reduce the cost, but the foundations were suspect here. The soil conditions were suspect. And so um, this structure was designed to be as light as it can possibly be. The joinery gets pretty complicated, but even that's not too bad when you realize these steel plates are welded into the corner of this uh, box beam, uh, which is the place where the box beam is strongest. And they're welded on each, each edge, basically, um, which provides a really excellent way of connecting these uh, trust tubes. And here's another example of such a structure where two elements are leaning together and they're touching each other, but it's also fully triangulated uh, with these uh, heavier horizontal elements and then these diagonals, which are very delicate um, trust tubes. So that ends our discussion of triangulated braces for tall buildings or so-called trust tube buildings. Again, the purpose of these buildings is to give the brace frame the widest possible footing in all directions for maximum resistance to overturning. And the best way to do that is to move the frame out to the perimeter of the building, which produces a tubular truss surrounding the building, which in addition to its resistance to overturning moment is also torsionally very stiff.